uh, my disclosures. Uh, hip instability, it's the main number one or number two cause of failure in 20 to 25% of, of hip replacements, and that's in the big registries, Australian, UK, American Joint Replacement Registry. It's the second leading cause of failure in patients over 70 and less than 60, reported by Epinet. And because of the fear of dislocation of their total hip, some people change their job, plumbers, um, firemen, people that kayak, people that want to rock climb. And so we went to larger metal heads to try to fix this, and we got trunnionosis, thin poly. But if we go to dual mobility, Guyan reports that dual mobility adds 30 degrees of flexion, 15 degrees of abduction, and 22 degrees of external rotation over our native hip. The history of dual mobility is not new. I had one of my partners not long ago say, well, I'm waiting, it's kind of a new device, I'm gonna see what happens, and I said, wait a minute. This has been used in Europe for over 35 years, and it's just been improved and improved. Dual mobility implant types, you know, John gave an excellent talk, and he's a hard guy to follow. Um, monoblock shell, which I agree and use in small patients, so I can use a 28 head, so I get ability to increase and decrease leg lengths. Modular, uh, unfortunately, the, many designs have cobalt chrome, and I'm gonna to touch on that as well. And then one design has oxidized zirconium, which eliminates that issue. So the advantages of dual mobility, this paper looking at the instance and temporal trends of dislocation after use of constrained implants versus dual mobility implants in primary total hips that were high risk. Their systematic review of the literature showed constrained hips had a failure rate of 1.1% at four years and 0.1% for dual mobility at four years. We published a paper in Houston on constrained cups um, appearing incapable of meeting the demands of revision total hips, 57 retrievals. We had ring damage and breakage in 94% of the retrievals and 100% showed rim impingement and massive polyethylene uh, wear. That, that paper caused me to just quit using uh, constrained cups, and I haven't used a constrained cup in years. So advantages of modern dual mobility, it's a reduced risk of dislocation and revision. Hogan reports in dual mobility versus 36 millimeter standard cups, the dislocation rate was 0.5% versus 4.5%. This paper, Nicholas Rayner from the Mayo Clinic uh, in Journal of Arthroplasty shows dual mobility constructs in primary and revision total hips. In the primary group, it was 0.9% for dual mobility, 6.8% uh, for the, mono, for the uh, standard cup. And in revision, it was 2.2% versus 7. Point. These are multiples of factors of dislocation. There are lower rates of dislocation and lower rates of revision in a systematic, their systematic review. If we look at modern cups, Jonker reports on almost 6,000 dual mobility cups and 217,000 cups in a systematic review. Lower rates of revision and dislocation in dual mobility cups, zero intraprosthetic dislocations in that large series after 2007 with modern designs. Dareth reports on a review of 54 articles, 10,000 dual mobilities with 0% intraprosthetic dislocation. So are there still concerns? Yeah, I've got them, same ones John has. Intraprosthetic dislocations I'm not worried about, and I personally haven't seen one. Trunnionosis, though, is an issue in designs with cobalt chrome on titanium. In a meta-analysis of literature, ions over one microgram per liter in seven, almost eight percent of all of these, and significantly raised over seven micrograms in 1.8 percent, and that's when it starts to get scary. Mouse seating of the liner may be design dependent, this MDM design is in the March issue uh, in press of Journal of Arthroplasty. They had 11.1%. And these aren't community surgeons. These are academic surgeons publishing, looking at their results and seeing a problem. Designs, and there's more than one that has an alignment peg, that can help you prevent misassembly and seat that liner um, uh, straight. There's another paper, Savini, uh, that actually John also referenced the same paper showing uh, co cobalt and chromium ion levels significantly elevated. None of them had pseudotumors, but again, there's a significant correlation between the ion levels and the UCLA activity score. This paper by Mattson and Co., they had 9% had elevated cobalt levels above 1.6 micrograms per liter. Mars MRI was performed in four of their patients who had cobalt over 4.5 micrograms. Two of them had alval 
problem with this paper is they weren't sure there was a hip on the other side in some of them, or was it trunnionosis, but it still concludes that MDM should be used with care and you gotta evaluate these patients. I'm not advancing. Can you help me advance? Maybe I can go back. Ah, this is the scary part of this. This paper by Bridges in 2020, they looked at 247 of their clinic patients that had cobalt chrome prosthesis, some metal metal, some metal on polyethylene. They had a validated inventory of higher function skills for patients and symptomatic patients on that validated inventory with a blood cobalt level above 0.4 micrograms per liter uh, or a urine cobalt greater than one microgram per liter underwent functional PET scans. 123 patients were at that, almost half their patients were at that threshold, 69 were scanned. All of the patients, 100%, had significant regional hypometabolism and higher symptoms inventory. There was no difference in the metal on metal and metal on polyethylene in the patterns of hypometabolism. And they state that neurological toxicity from what I consider normal cobalt and chromium ion levels in these implants from elevated systemic cobalt has a pattern similar to heavy metals and solvents differing from classical dementias and occur at cobalt levels as low as 0.4 micrograms per liter. So what about where? And John touched on this also. There's three bearing surfaces, the outer ball of the polyethylene, the inner ball, and then the neck against uh, the, the edge of the polyethylene. And this is where we've had improvements uh, from the early first designs. Stolberg showed highly crossing polyethylene and dual mobility, showed lower wear than conventional uh, cups, and Loving et al. in a simulator with the most severe types of testing that it had 75% lower wear compared to fixed bearing conventional polyethylene. But one of the advances is uh, designs that get eccentricity that helps drive self-aligning poly. If you look on the right, you're continually getting wear at the edge of the neck. This eccentric design, once you start moving, centers the polyethylene and you don't get that, um, that wear. So this is uh, the OR3O design, this eccentricity with a medialized XLPE insert, but a lateralized insert, a uh, lateralized liner causes that self-centering that when you walk, you don't get impingement on the edge of the polyethylene. So in conclusion, highly crossing polyethylene, smaller smooth necks, avoiding skirts, and better design cavities almost eliminated intraprosthetic dislocation. And my only concern is metal ions and designs and materials matter more here than in your fixed bearing hips. And I suggest designs that have an alignment peg and no cobalt chrome. There's a dramatic reduction in both revision and dislocations in large review articles with this bearing choice. Studies predict significant savings in cost of care and this super physiologic arc of motion makes it a very forgiving procedure. Thank you. <laughs>